Hello, and welcome to Chasing Leviathan, the podcast where we pursue big questions. My goal today is to listen and learn just a little bit more. As we head into our conversation, let me invite you to chase life's biggest questions with me, one episode at a time. So kind of as we we get started here, do you mind telling us a little bit about your own journey into philosophy and uh, what led you to uh, write this book? Here, I'll share it with our audience here. The best of all possible worlds. I got the hardcover. I couldn't resist. (laughs) I I actually didn't like the, uh, so I had a different image for the cover, but they went with that one. Uh, But the image I liked went on the paperback. So um, I suggest people get the paperback edition. There you go. Yeah, the better the better cover. I, I knew it. I knew I messed up. Um, so go ahead. Tell us a little bit about right. your journey, though. So um, I went off to college uh, in 1976, not really knowing what I was going to major in, what I wanted to do. And in my very first semester, um, I, for some reason, signed up for Philosophy uh, 110, an introduction to philosophy class. And the professor was so enthusiastic exuded so much energy and excitement. Uh, and I enjoyed the class so much that in my very first semester, I decided that's what I want to do. And so I declared a philosophy major and never looked back. Um, that was at Washington University in St. Louis, um, where I went. I grew up in the New York area, New York City area, uh, and then went back to Columbia for graduate school. And I got a PhD in philosophy in 1986. Uh, and then ended up out here at in Wisconsin, in Madison, Wisconsin, in 1988. And I've been teaching here ever since. Uh, courses, anything from introduction to philosophy to upper-level courses uh, on various topics in philosophy to graduate seminars in my own field, which is uh, essentially 17th century philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. And while I want to hear what you have to say about this book in particular, can you talk about... Uh, it's obvious that you're you're motivated by a larger project in regards to uh, the entirety of the 17th century. So, I mean, you have multiple books on, obviously, uh, Leibniz, Descartes, uh, Spinoza. What drew you to that time period? That's a good question. I'm not sure I have a good answer to it. I just found the 17th century in all of its dimensions fascinating. I've dabbled. You know, not only have I devoted um, time to 17th century philosophy, and here, remember, in the 17th century, philosophy is a very broad term and included things that we today would call theology, but also things that we today would call science. So there was natural philosophy or the philosophy of nature. And so when you're studying 17th century philosophy, you're not just working in epistemology and metaphysics, um, but you're covering a very broad range of topics, philosophical questions um, about religion, about politics, about ethics, about nature. Um, as well as metaphysics and epistemology. Um, But I also have um, my work on Spinoza especially um, has led me into uh, various other dimensions of 17th century culture and especially 17th century Dutch culture. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so I've done some work on um, Dutch art. Um, I have a biography of the painter Franz Hals coming out um, later this year. Um, I wrote a book on Rembrandt's relationship with uh, the Jewish community in Amsterdam. And um, I've also written a biography of Manasseh ben Israel, who was a rabbi in the Amsterdam Jewish community, the same community that uh, banned Spinoza. So I, I find for some reason the 17th century an extraordinarily rich period, but that's especially true for philosophy. I think there, it really is um, philosophy's greatest century with the only possible competition coming from late 5th, early 4th century Athens. That was a pretty good period too. Um, (laughs) It was all right. Um, But the the 17th century, you really have um, not just a renewal, but a really a transformation of philosophy. And what we think of as philosophy today um, really begins in the 17th century. A lot of the questions that we discuss as philosophers um, about knowledge and epistemology, about reality and metaphysics, questions about science, questions about the makeup of the world, um, how do we view the human being and what's the human being's place in the cosmos. 
Um, the way in which these questions were addressed in the 17th century by appealing not to some sacred texts, not to some ancient authorities like Aristotle or Plato, but in fact by using our own rational natural faculties to come to some kind of reasonable determination of these questions, um, that's what philosophy has been since the 17th century. And it really was, while there are, there are great continuities between what we call medieval philosophy and what we call modern philosophy. I mean, there's no, there was no year where people said, okay, we're going to stop being medieval. Now we're going to be modern. <laughs> um, and, the, you know, there's a great deal of continuity. Descartes' language in many respects is uh, a carryover from uh, medieval scholasticism. But there's no question that something new and interesting and original and influential happened to philosophy in the 17th century. Um, and with thinkers like Galileo, Descartes, John Locke, Robert Boyle, uh, Spinoza, Leibniz, Newton, uh, Mary Astell, um, Anne Conway, uh, you know, a grand and very diverse group of thinkers that you can't really say we're all doing the same thing. I mean, what, what really is there in common between a Spinoza and a Pascal? Um, and yet, somehow, they saw themselves as part of a single philosophical, or maybe not single, but part of a philosophical c a community, or, or what's often been called the Republic of Letters, um, despite the fact that they were living in vastly different domains, supporting themselves in very different ways, writing about very different topics from very different perspectives. Pascal was a devoutly religious man. I think Spinoza, to my mind, was an atheist. Uh, and yet, there's a conversation going on there. Um, sometimes it's a friendly conversation. Sometimes it's a, it's a very contentious one. Um, and, you know, that you can find very harsh and personal, um, personal debates taking place. But there was a community. Um, and through treatises, through articles and journals, uh, through correspondence, personal correspondence and public correspondence, through book reviews, there was this vast dialogue going on. And I think that's what makes the 17th century so rich and fascinating for philosophy. Absolutely. What is the value of getting to know the history of philosophy for you by placing these moments inside their particular circumstances? Well, it's tempting to think of ideas as these disembodied things that float freely above the, the real world. Uh, and you can do a study of ideas as ideas. You know, what is causation? What is reality? What is the mind? What is body? Without really thinking who's asking these questions, what are their circumstances? But then you don't really get a sense of what philosophy was uh, as a discipline, as a vocation. Um, you can't, for example, understand Spinoza without taking into account um, the political and religious context of the 17th century Dutch Republic. Um, you'd be very hard pressed to understand John Locke's essay concerning human understanding without seeing the broader scientific context in, uh, in England in the second half of the 17th century, developments in chemistry uh, with Robert Boyle and experimental science. Um, and then there's a, the very personal dimensions. Um, in, in the book that we're gonna talk about, um, the debate between Antoine Arnaud, who was a very um, embattled and contentious Jansenist in the French Catholic Church, um, his family difficulties, um, the way in which the Jansenists were attacked by church and civic authorities. And then you have this very um, intense debate, which got very personal both between Arnaud and Leibniz, between Arnaud and Malbranche, and discussions, conversations between Leibniz and Malbranche. Um, what makes studying this period so interesting is that these were such fascinating personalities. Arnaud was an extremely irascible, short-tempered man. And at one point, um, in, when his response to Leibniz's discourse of metaphysics uh, was, was a, little, uh, a little too hot-headed for Leibniz, Leibniz wrote to Arnaud saying, Jesus, no wonder you don't have any friends left, essentially. <laughs> you know, you're, you're such a hothead. Uh, and then the debate between Arnaud and Malbranche got very personal, uh, full of insults. Um, and it's really hard, I think, to understand the commitment that they had to ideas without understanding 
their personal, their political, and their religious situations. Oh, and that that totally makes sense. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was Malbranch that was correcting Arnaud uh, about the fact that they weren't actually friends, right? Arnaud would, was saying, oh, uh, yeah, we, ha- we hung out all the time and we'd hang out for hours and talk. And Malbranch is like, no, maybe twice, like never, never alone. Is that, is, am I remembering that correctly? Uh, they had very different views about their relationship. <laughs> but, you know, it's interesting because Ar- Arnaud um, really didn't hold back in his criticisms. He was, he was um, a harsh but honest individual. I guess he didn't have time for niceties. Whereas you get the sense that Malbranche was a rather gentle soul. And I think he was somewhat taken aback by the vitriol that Arnaud threw at him. But Arnaud took this all very seriously. I mean, to him, uh, as a as a Jansenist theologian, it mattered very much to him how God's grace operated. It mattered very much to Malbranche as well. But this was not just an abstract academic debate for them. It was uh, intensely personal. And uh, you mentioned this uh, earlier. It's very clear that they were not distinguishing between disciplines and it very quickly ran into practical application with what we would often think are very abstract debates when you when you talk about these sort of things. Yeah, so Ar- when Arnaud first um, read, I'm trying to get my, um, get the order of things straight. Um, in- initially, Arnaud had seen some of Malbranche's uh, work, the, the Search After Truth, um, and had a, a fairly um, mild opinion of it. But then in 1680, when Malbranche followed this up with his treatise on nature and grace, Arnaud basically thought, holy shit, this, this is more to this. Uh, this is really troubling because Malbranche completely uh, gets it wrong in how divine grace operates. So then he went back and looked at the search after truth and found a lot to object to. And so he begins his, his initial attack on Malbranche, not directly addressing the matter of grace, but by taking issue with Malbranche's views on the nature of the human mind, um, the ideas through which knowledge operates, and the, uh, the representational content of mental states, which you would think, okay, that's, that's really very interesting, but what does it, you know, who, who really cares? Um, you know, I, I wrote my PhD dissertation on just that, primarily that aspect of the debate, Arnaud's theory of ideas. But then you see that what he's doing is, what Arnaud is doing is that he's trying to undermine the philosophical foundations of Malbranche's theodicy, theology. And um, it's a very wise uh, tactic because it shows that Malbranche, Malbranche was a very systematic thinker. And you can, you can come at him from different angles. And, and Arnaud says, well, look, I'm going to come at it from the ground up. Let's first address the philosophical questions of how the human mind works and what our relationship to God is in something as mundane as perception and knowing. And then let's go deeper and we can talk about God's modus operandi in the course of nature as a cause. We can talk about how God distributes grace. Um, and, and that's the real issue. And that's where things start to get nasty. But even throughout the, dec- the two decades of their debate, um, neither of them dropped the epistemological questions. They were always there, but now in the context of the broader theological issues. I definitely want to return to this debate because that's obviously the heart of the book, um, you know, uh, adding Leibniz into there. Do you mind giving our listeners just a brief um, overview, situating the historical moment, like what's going on politically? Um, Obviously, like uh, (laughs) Arnaud, this is this is why Malbranche says you have no friends left. Or no, Leibniz says you have no friends left. Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) you have no friends left. And um, I think there's obviously, to be fair, more going on there, right? Um, with the Jansenist uh, kind of not insurrection, but the uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Denou- uh, the denouncing by uh, the French government, right? Yeah. So the Jansenists were um, technically uh, part of the French Catholic Church. 
Um, but they took issue with the way in which they saw the church being corrupted, especially by the Jesuits. Um, and so they adopted a more austere program of penitential discipline. That is, in order to um, really be deserving of, uh, and really you can't earn God's grace, but you have to have a real, you, you can't just go to confession and do whatever the priest tells you or pay some fees and have your sins forgiven. And the Jansenists were very concerned. You see this in Pascal's um, letters, um, pro called the Provincial Letters, how the Jesuits were simply s basically selling indulgences. And, you know, if you go, if, if taking communion once doesn't do the trick, take communion multiple times and eventually um, you'll find yourself um, in God's good graces. But the other thing that troubled the Jansenists was this idea that even after the fall of the human being, um, we still had within ourselves the capacity to contribute to our own salvation and some element of free will, such that even if we received God's grace, it was up to us to make good or bad use of it. And so um, the Jansenists believed that um, this was heretical, that there is no freedom um, after the fall, that human beings are defiled, sinful creatures, and the only way in which they can achieve salvation is through God's grace. They can make no contribution to it on their own. Uh, moreover, if God gives you grace, it's not you are not free to accept or reject it. Those who receive grace will do good works, and those who don't receive grace will not. So the Jansenists had a very strict view of the, operation, self, the operations of salvation. Um, this earned them um, the, the enmity of both the Jesuits and the French church, but also uh, the Vatican, um, the Holy Office in Rome, um, issued several um, um, remonstrances against Jansenism. And so they were embattled on, on all sides. At a certain point, the, uh, the French authorities disbanded the Jansenist retreats at Port Royal and in Paris. Uh, Arnaud eventually went into exile in the Netherlands. And most of the rest of his career, including his debates with Leibniz and Malbranche, were spent um, while he was in the Low Countries. Uh, Malbranche, on the other hand, was a member of the Oratory, which was another order within the French Catholic Church. Um, the Oratory was often seen as a little bit more open-minded than the Jesuit order. Uh, and in fact, some of the Oratorians were open to uh, the new Cartesian philosophy, that is Descartes' philosophy. Um, and Malbranche's views on grace seemed to the uh, Jansenists like Arnaud to be a little bit too close to the Jesuit view whereby um, God's grace, according to the way in which Arnaud read Malbranche, um, God's grace was not necessarily efficacious. Uh, for the Jansenists, God's grace is necessarily efficacious. It does what God wants it to do. But um, in Arnaud's eyes, Malbranche's views on grace rendered God a little less omnipotent because sometimes grace, according to Malbranche, would fall uh, on a person who's not prepared to accept it. We, we can go deeper into the weeds if you want, but it's essentially, um, does God achieve everything God wants to achieve simply by virtue of wanting to do it? Or do human beings play some role in the efficacy of God's will? And that leads into debates even today um, that you see divides in philosophy and certain disciplines on our humans essentially good or are they essentially bad right like what are we working with and so that's kind of part of the the debate here right except you know in in the 17th century case and i suppose in a lot of contemporary religious debates you have this uh very um preset theological context that that is the fall Right. Um, when you talk about whether human nature today is good or bad, um, we don't tend to think of it as um, involving any kind of original sin, especially if, you, if you're not Christian. Um, 
You can talk about are human beings naturally good or naturally bad, or you can reject this whole notion of human nature altogether and say, well, no, there are some good people and there are some bad people. Um, and you don't have to buy into any kind of theological um, framework for any of that. Correct. Yeah. And that, that's a, uh, it was a brutal simplification. The, uh, but there, there it, to me, it sounds like there's often, uh, even from an evolutionary perspective, that kind of the way of telling the story of like progress versus, uh, the way that people, uh, are constantly in struggle with each other. But yeah. I, I'm, I'm getting into the weeds there and that, that, that wasn't my intention. Well, as the, you say, you know, Steve, yeah. Stephen Pinker has made a lot of, of, uh, spent a lot of time lately with his books trying to show that, yes, we've made a great deal of progress. Everything is better than it used to be. Um, I, I think it's really hard to justify that, that claim, um, not just with, of course, obvious counterexamples like the Holocaust, um, but, you know, look at the tragedies, the, the horrors in Europe today with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, with um, famine and natural disasters with um the way in which we treat each other i mean it's hard to argue that american society today is in better shape than it was uh you know even just two decades ago much less 100 years and i think that idea of optimism like essential optimism and essential pessimism is maybe a better way of framing it than good or bad uh because i yeah. mean and that's where i'm I haven't read it, but I've I have looked at Stephen Pinkner's work. I'm, I'm, yeah, that's partly what I was thinking of. So, um, but uh, going back to Mal Branch and uh, Arno, um, can Which you? I'm add... sure your listeners are dying to hear yeah. more about. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, I, 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 what I'm trying to do is to help understand. You know, that's where a lot of these today's framing comes from. Like even when you talk about. Uh, and, and if you read philosophers today, they'll often talk about this. The idea of human dignity is really, uh, at least in the political context, comes from John Locke, you know, primarily, I would think people would argue. And so and that was a religious concept that he used to to articulate that. And of course, it's taken on secular importance now. But I think uh, I, I take a lot of. uh from Wittgenstein when it comes to, to philosophy and the idea that philosophy is getting to fly out of the bottle. And so whenever I get stuck at a dead end that I can't figure out, I, I often think like there's a lot of value in going back. And so it, when we start having these inherent contradictions in our society, I think something like the studies that you do are so important because we can find the dialogues that created these moments that we are now sitting with. If that makes sense. Right. Yeah, I think to frame it in terms of optimism and pessimism, it, it's a good way to look at it. Um, and especially this, this debate that's the subject of the book, because you have on the one hand, Leibniz, who I suppose is the first great, truly great optimist. Um, and then you have um, Arnaud, who I think is a, a deeply pessimistic thinker. Um, with Malbranche, I think you're somewhere in the middle. The problem is that optimism has been greatly misunderstood uh, ever since Voltaire parodied it in Candide. Leibniz, so for Leibniz, just to remind your readers, Leibniz, um, the question is, how are we supposed to make sense of a world created by an omnipotent, uh, benevolent, omniscient God? Um, I mean, look at the world around you. It's full of sin and suffering, wickedness, natural disasters, moral, um, moral disasters. Um, how can we reconcile these two things? So one thing you can do is to say, well, look, um, God knows about these evils and would like to do something about them, but can't. Well, you can't take that approach because that would undermine God's omnipotence. Well, you could say God can do something about them and would like to do something about them if only God knew about them. But God doesn't know about all these, these petty evils. Well, you can't take that approach because that would undermine God's omniscience. Well, then you could say, well, well God um, can do something about them and knows about them, but doesn't care about them. But then if you take that approach, you're undermining divine benevolence. So there's a real interesting philosophical 
theological conundrum. So Leibniz comes along and tries to resolve it. He's the first to use this term. He coined the term theodicy for what really is a justification or an explanation of God's modus operandi. How can we reconcile um, the existence of evil and sin and suffering in a world created by an omnipotent, omniscient, and benevolent God? Leibniz says, well, look, if God is truly perfect, then we know that God cannot do anything but choose the best of all possible worlds to create. There are infinitely many possible worlds, but for God to have chosen a less than best world would not be consistent with God's infinite goodness and wisdom. Therefore, um, the world that God did create, namely this world, with all of its facts and details, must be the best of all possible worlds. Voltaire thinks, or maybe who knows what he really thought, but in, <laughs> in, his, in Candide, he parodies this by taking Candide on this journey where he's exposed to the most horrendous crimes and evils imaginable. Um, and the question, the subtle question is, really, this is the best of all possible, this is the best God can do. But Leibniz is not saying that in the best of all, of all possible worlds, everybody gets their ultimate happiness. Um, he's not saying that in the best of all possible worlds, everything works out for the best for every individual. What he's saying is um, you, need to, you need to step back a bit and take a broader perspective. And what you see when you take that broader perspective is that everything contributes to the bestness of this world. And were this world to lack even one of these inconveniences, so, you know, it rained on my picnic, how can this be the best of all possible worlds if it's going to rain on my picnic? Well, imagine a world in which everything is the same, except it doesn't rain on my picnic on that day. Wouldn't that be a better world? And Leibniz says, no, it might be a better world for you, but because that world is different in just that one respect, from the present created world, it's not the best of all possible worlds. It differs from this world, and we know a priori that this is the best of all possible worlds. Therefore, God would not have created that world. So when God chooses this world, Leibniz wants to say, it's not that he says, oh, I really want to see it rain on Nadler's parade. I'm going to choose. Rather, God looks at the entire creation considers the simplicity of the laws of the world and the richness of the phenomena that those laws generate and sees that that contributes to the overall goodness of the world. However, God also sees that in this best of all possible worlds, it's going to rain on Nadler's parade. And God says, well, yeah, that's, that's how it's going to go. It's not that God directly wants it to rain on my parade, but God allows it to happen as a consequence of God's choice of this, the best of all possible worlds. Yes. Uh, and I have to confess, I have never read Leibniz, even though I found his ideas interesting. And I think there's something to be said for uh, a lot of philosophy comes down to uh, the persuasiveness of the philosophy. And I made the mistake of reading Voltaire's Candide first. And the humor, it was the, the smear job is so good. Yeah, it's, a, it's, <laughs> it's very so entertaining. funny. Yeah. yeah, it's a very entertaining work. But it it either intentionally or uh, accidentally misconstrues the, the point that Leibniz is trying to make. But yeah, it's yeah. one of the great parodies in history. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, and it's short too, which is, a, you know, uh, right. for me was a blessing. But it was, uh, it, yes, it was very funny. Um, but I, I think that there's, uh, you know, even as you, you talk about this, um, it really comes down to, and I believe this is in the Eternal Truths chapter, um, the three of these men are arguing and you you say that they kind of come down with Malebranche and Leibniz versus Arnaud. And the, the question is, is the world run by wisdom or is the world run by power? Right. Can you talk a little bit about the the way that that debate played out and what are the consequences for that that debate? Yeah, the real the deeper issue there um, is each philosopher's conception of God. Um, so for Arnaud, uh, in this respect, he's really following Descartes. 
Descartes had said that um, God is not like us. You know, in human beings, you have you have reason, you have ideas, and you have will. Um, and the challenge is for us to give our assent or give our consent only to things that we clearly and distinctly perceive. Uh, and we go wrong when we misuse our free will and give our assent to things that we only understand uh, incompletely or partially or obscurely. So this notion that we are uh, we have this distinction between will and understanding. Descartes says, well, that can't possibly apply to God. God is an infinite being who is so different from us, um, infinitely different from us, um, that we cannot model God's way of acting on the human way of acting. And Arnaud follows Descartes in this respect. And he says, look, God is all power. And even the truths that we consider to be eternal truths, like the truths of mathematics and the truths of logic, um, we as human beings, as rational agents, we discover these truths. That's how we operate. But God creates these truths. God makes one plus one equal to two. And in principle, God could have made one plus one equal to three. So there's a model of God's nature where omnipotence or power is the most important and primary attribute of God. Uh, it follows from that that whatever God does is good. God doesn't choose things because they're good. That's how we operate. Um, we pursue things if we think they're good. Um, God doesn't work that way. Whatever God does is good simply by virtue of being what God does. This goes back to a very ancient problem that we find in Plato's dialogue, the Euthyphro. There the question is, uh, Socrates asks Euthyphro, tell me, Euthyphro, what is piety? Euthyphro says, piety is what the gods love. And what Euthyphro means is that something is pious if the gods love it. That is, the piety of something is determined by the fact that the gods love that thing. And Socrates essentially says, well, if that's the way it works, then the gods are arbitrary, and piety is an arbitrary thing, so the gods love this, but they could just as well love that. And if they had loved that, then that would have been pious. And so the whole notion of something being pious or good becomes trivial. There is no independent objective standard of goodness independent of the gods' will. Uh, and this, in a way, is the position taken by Descartes and Arnaud. They are really on Euthyphro's side. I mean, it's, it's a simplification, but we could put it that way. Leibniz and Malebranche, on the other hand, think, well, no, that, that's really an incoherent way of thinking of God. God is a rational agent very much like we are. And in order to preserve any kind of meaningful sense of divine justice and wisdom, you have to make God just as subject to universal, necessary, eternal and objective standards as we are. And so that's why Leibniz's God chooses the world that is, objectively speaking, the best. Descartes or Arnaud would say, well, whatever world God chooses would therefore, by that fact, be the best world because God chose it. Leibniz is saying, well, no, that would be a very irrational, capricious God. The true way of thinking about God is to think not, of, not as sheer omnipotent power, but as wisdom, as, as a just being who strives to maximize um, goodness and power and find a way of achieving all of its values. That's God as a, as a rational agent, and that's the God of Malbranche and Leibniz. So really, beneath this debate in the 17th century, you have what's really fundamental are these different conception of what God is and how God operates. Right. And uh, I think even as I was reading this and, uh, you know, maybe this is this is a dumb question, but I'm OK with that. The uh, where do the standards that God holds to come from? That, that's the thing. They don't come from anywhere. They are there. They're eternal principles, eternal values. Uh, Malbranche gives us a little bit more detail. He says, um, 
in God, there is what he calls order, capital O, order, which are, um, these are sort of the supreme laws of everything. <laughs> so it, there are, when God creates the world, you have the laws of physics, you have the laws that, that determine how the mind and the body interact in human being, you have the laws that determine how minds work, and these are all created laws because they're a function of the world that God has created. Um, you also have laws that determine the distribution of grace. These are laws that God follows, but they're not necessarily eternal laws. They're laws that God has instituted. But above and beyond all of these laws, you have order. And these are the eternal principles that are derivable from God's attributes. And so order, for example, determines that justice and wisdom have precedence over power. Order also determines that a soul is a more valuable thing than a body. These are not truths that God establishes, but these are eternal parts, uh, eternal features of God's understanding reflecting God's attributes. So they're not, they don't come from anywhere. They're co-eternal with God. What is, are the biggest cultural legacies of, from this debate? Do you see any uh, still of this, any, any of this debate still working out today? Yeah, I do think that, that what's called the Euthyphro problem are things good. So in, in the Euthyphro's terms, is it good because God made it or did God make it because it's good? Now, one very concrete way of making that relevant for religiously inclined people today is how do you read the first, the opening chapters of the Hebrew Bible? When God creates the world and sees that it's good, you could ask, well, is it good because God made it or did God make it because it's good? Um, the other very relevant and I think a very timely way of thinking about all this is where do moral values get their normative force. I think you'll find a, a large number of people think that moral values derive their normative force, that is their oughtness, from the fact that there is a God who will punish sinners and reward the virtuous. And without God, there's no morality. I think that's a very deep and serious mistake, and it conflates piety, religious piety, with morality. Um, if you think that what is morally right is morally right because God has proclaimed it to be morally right, and that what's morally wrong is morally unjustifiable because God has proclaimed it to be morally wrong, then you cannot therefore also say that God is good because that's a trivial claim. Whatever God, there's no, in other words, if you're going to say that God is good, there has to be some kind of standard of goodness, some kind of uh, set of moral values independent of God. And by appealing to those values or standards, you can then say, yes, God is good. So whatever you think the, um, the source of morality is, it can't be in God's will if you also want to say that God is good. Moreover, I think that religious values have to be kept separate from moral values. And, you know, that's a very concrete problem we face in this country today. People insisting that we can legislate morality on the basis of our religious principles. And I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm greatly afraid that various members of the Supreme Court today are taking their religious beliefs and using them to render decisions affecting our moral lives. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about relevance, that would definitely be up there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, especially when you hear uh, Clarence Thomas saying, well, look, here's what's next. Um, gay marriage. There's absolutely, whatever you, one may think about gay marriage from a religious perspective, and I don't have any religious views in that was it. But, you know, I understand there are people out there who feel that they ought to object to gay marriage on a religious basis. Well, you know, I, I don't see that it's a legitimate religious issue. It's got nothing to do with your relationship to God if you believe in God. But what 
gay marriage certainly is not is a moral issue because it involves two consenting adults. And if there's no harm brought about through the actions of two consenting adults, how can it possibly be a moral issue at all? Right. Yeah, I, it, it's interesting. Uh, and I think that there's even a, a transfer here, aside from uh, religious people today. Uh, I, I think the, the point that you're making that's, that's valuable here is distinguishing between the problems of authority, what are the sources of authority, and the problems of morality. So even for uh, an atheist, for example, like the, there is that still that question of like, are there eternal standards of good that I am judging against? Or maybe not eternal, but are there like logical, you know, if you, I, I've seen ph uh, philosophers trying to create normative frameworks of good and then other people who talk about those being socially conditioned. Right. And, and that's actually a separate thing from uh, where does authority come from? So obviously we have uh, some people who are saying authority in our country comes from religion and then other people saying authority comes from, you know, the the people there's different models for you know like when you talk about the constitution that sort of thing but it, it's just um i i think it's it's really valuable to distinguish between like where does authority come from and then even okay you've established the authority but like you still have to answer how a morality works with that authority if that makes sense by authority do you mean the normativity of these rules like their oughtness yes yeah, I, no, I think that's absolutely right. Um, it's one thing to ask from a from the position of norm what we call normative ethics. What should I do? You know, uh, how do I? Well, and, and even there, there's a distinction. Um, there's the very concrete, practical question that you might ask in this or that circumstances. What should I do now? Then there's the more general question: How am I to determine what I should do now? So uh, let's say I'm facing a dilemma and I don't know whether to do action A or action B. That's a very concrete moral dilemma. Um, and I may or may not have an answer to that in these circumstances. The more general question is, what principles do I use to make that decision? So, for example, I might be a utilitarian. I might think that I should make that decision between A and B on the basis of which action brings about the greater happiness of the greater, greater number. Or I might be a Kantian. I might think with Kant that I should do that action that I could universalize into a moral law governing all, all agents. Um, that's still in the realm of, of um, normative ethics. That is, what should I do? How am I to act? Um, th and that's both what should I do now in this situation and what are my general principles to guide me in action. Then you have a whole different set of questions about what, and this is what philosophers call meta-ethics. We're getting way off piste here from the, uh, the best of all possible worlds. Uh, but then, you know, meta-ethical questions concern such things as what, are, what is the status of moral judgments? Do they hold objectively or subjectively? Um, what does it mean um, to say that something is good or that something is bad? What kind of predicate is good? These are all very abstract questions that may or may not help you determine what to do in this. Probably but they won't help you to determine what to do in this or that situation. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it, questions about normativity go across all these, all these areas. Well, and part of me is, uh, it, it's important to me to draw those lines for our listeners to understand the value of the book, right? Like, uh, these are questions that are really being formulated. And, uh, and I want to ask one specific question about the book to kind of, as we start wrapping up here, um, because all three of these men are then having to deal with, you call it the specter of Spinoza. Which right. is kind of interesting, even as we've talked here about uh, religion has continued as a force in the public square. But then we also have, uh, in, in many ways, uh, atheism. And I, I do agree with you. Like, it seems like Spinoza was talking around his atheism so he didn't get in trouble. <laughs> yeah. But uh, 
that atheism now becomes a real and what I would say, like secular life becomes uh, much more of an option. Whereas before, you know, with the Hundred Years War, I mean, your religion was not just it was intimately bound with church and state. Right. And so uh, can you uh, talk a little bit about uh, how the arrival, if I can put it that way, of Spinoza affected the debate between Malbranche, Arnaud and Leibniz? The, uh, what, what Spinoza brings to the table is a rejection of the entire um, framework of God being a kind of agent of any sort. Uh, Spinoza's God is not, uh, is not an agent in a psychological sense. God, Spinoza's God doesn't have beliefs or expectations, uh, doesn't issue commandments, doesn't, is never disappointed, has no emotions. Um, is never pleased or dissatisfied. Um, and Spinoza's God also doesn't have any moral characteristics. Spinoza's God uh, isn't just and wise, doesn't punish or reward. Uh, Spinoza's God is just nature. All there is is nature. Nature is an infinite, eternal whole, and everything that exists, exists in and through nature, and with the necessity that comes about through nature's laws. And so, whatever differences there may be between Descartes, Arnaud, Malbranc, and Leibniz, they're all still adopting um, this picture of God as a kind of agent. So, this, you know, the traditional Abrahamic God who does things, even if they differ in their conceptions about the way in which God operates. Um, and yet, um, they're all, they all have one eye on Spin, well, not Descartes, um, he's, he's long dead by this point. But they all have one eye on Spinoza because nobody wants to be accused of being a Spinozist. Despite that, um, the charge of being a Spinozist is going back and forth between them. So um, Arnaud believes that Malbranche is a kind of Spinozist because Malbranche also introduces this whole other element, which we don't really have to talk about, that matter is in a way an attribute of God which is, seems to be very close to what Spinoza says, that one of God's or nature's attributes is matter or extension. Leibniz seems to be a bit of a Spinozist, and I think probably uh, himself was afraid that he was committed to some kind of deep Spinozism, because Leibniz believes, if, if, if you really took, take Leibniz's principles about God choosing the best of all possible worlds to their ultimate logical conclusion, you get the following scenario. God is an absolutely perfect being. The world that is the best of all possible worlds is necessarily the best of all possible worlds. And it also seems absolutely necessary that an absolutely perfect God can't do anything but choose the best of all possible worlds, which seems to make it, to be, which seems to make it the case that the existence of this world is now necessary. God right. could not possibly have done otherwise. And that looks like a kind of Spinozistic necessitarianism because Spinoza thinks there is no creation um, nature is eternal and infinite and exists absolutely necessarily. Uh, and so Leibniz, I think, was constantly had Spinoza in his rearview mirror, trying to find a way of, of having his um, deterministic cake, but avoiding the necessitarian, well, I'm mixing metaphors there, but, you know, avoiding the necessitarianism that, that might come with it. Yeah. Uh, trying to. Uh... I'm trying to combine driving with eating cake and it's not working in my head, but yeah. I, I like the but, idea of it. But Spinoza really uh, gums up the works here because now they're not just, you know, Arnaud is not just trying to get Malbranche and Leibniz on the right path, but he wants to avoid the Spinozistic vortex that's, that's troubling everybody. Absolutely. Uh, kind of as, as we wrap up and as we conclude here, uh, I was wondering, uh, what is something that you would leave, you know, obviously besides reading the book, which is, uh, you're, you're a good writer and it's fun to read, which, so congratulations on that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but, uh, um, so I, you know, I, I definitely recommend it to our listeners, but, uh, what would you leave to our, our audience as a takeaway from, from this discussion? So uh, the thing I, I like, the thing I like about the book is that um, it shows you how personal and lively uh, philosophy in the 17th century was. Uh, 
and how wide ranging. Um, I tried to bring out uh, the fact that in this period, philosophy was a conversation, a very live conversation, uh, a deeply personal and often emotional one. Um, and it wasn't just an abstract game, that there was a lot at stake. If you think eternal salvation is something real, then there's a lot at stake in these debates and getting it right. Um, at one point, Leibniz is wondering why Arnaud is reacting so harshly to his views. And Arnaud responds by saying, look, I, I'm, I'm afraid for you. Um, you should stop doing metaphysics and start paying attention to your, your salvation, the state of your soul. Um, these were, besides being philosophers, at least Arnaud and Malbranche, they were priests, uh, deeply pious men. Leibniz was a Lutheran, uh, he wasn't a Catholic, um, and one of his projects was, you know, it was a great, great project, was to heal the schism between Catholicism and Protestantism. Uh, looks like he failed. Right. But, um, <laughs> Last I the, checked. <laughs> this was, a, yeah, as far as I can tell. Um, but this was a big global project, and it mm. meant a lot. Um, and, you know, had he succeeded, imagine the court, how the course of history would have gone. But uh, on the other hand, you know, he was despite the fact that he was constantly on diplomatic missions, he, I don't get the sense that he was a great diplomat. <laughs> no, that does not come out. <laughs> no, he often, you know, in his letters and in his, and his essays, you see him often tailoring his language to the person he's speaking to, which is very diplomatic, but it makes for a tough understanding of what his true philosophical views are. Does he mean what he says to person X, or does he mean what he says to person Y? And, you know, there's still thousands of pieces of Leibniz's writings sitting in archives uh, in Hanover and elsewhere, um, which scholars are still going through. The man just wrote constantly. He couldn't help himself. And over the course of a long life produced, uh, you know, what was, was actually published by him in his lifetime was just a, a small fraction of what he wrote. And we're still editing there's still a lot that hasn't been published uh, by Leibniz. Yeah, and I, I love that you that we've ended on that note because uh, I think there's a lot of value in seeing the liveliness and the personal commitment that can be found in philosophy. And uh, I can't think of a, of a better way to end this. Thank you so much for coming, Dr. Nadler. Well, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. 